Hello everyone and welcome to my video tutorial on introduction to graph theory using Python and NetworkX. This is class 8 of a series, matchings and covers, and we will also cover the topic of the traveling salesman problem in this class. My name is Innocent Okoloko. Motivation Matchings and covers have practical applications in such areas as optimal job placement or optimal task assignment, logistics, and optimal routing, etc. Therefore, it is important to know about them. Learning objectives. At the end of the class, participants should be able to explain the concepts of matchings and covers, describe and analyze the optimal assignment problem, describe, analyze, and apply the Hungarian method for optimal assignment. Describe and analyze a traveling salesperson problem. Solve a traveling salesperson problem. Contents. Introduction to matchings and covers. The optimal assignment problem. Optimal assignment. The Hungarian method. Optimal assignment. Job matching. Traveling salesperson problem. So we begin with introduction to matchings and covers. Consider a problem of assigning people to tasks in an optimal manner. We see a first example. Suppose there are three workers, Alice, which we represent as A, Bob as B, Dora as D, and they are available for three job tasks as follows. First task is to clean the bathroom, which we represent as C. Second task is to sweep the floors, and the third task is to wash the windows, which will represent as W. But each of them demand different pay for the various tasks in dollars, as follows. A demands $8 for C, $4 for S, and $7 for W. B demands $5 for C, $2 for S, and $3 for W. And D demands $9 for C, $4 for S, and $8 for W. If you take a look at this, you will realize that D seems to offer the lowest cost for the tasks. However, we cannot just assign all of the tasks to B because there are some conditions that need to be met. Each of these tasks can be completed in a minimum of an hour, and all of the tasks must be completed in one hour. That means that we have to assign the tasks to the three people so that all of the tasks can be completed in one hour. So the problem now is to find the lowest cost way to assign the jobs such that each worker cannot be assigned to more than one task. This is a first example of the problem we are trying to solve in this class. Take a look at the second example. Suppose there are three programmers, Alice, Bob, and Dora, which emerge tops in a candidate's placement test for three programming positions as follows, JavaScript J, Python P, and C, C. But each of them have different levels of competencies for the programming languages as follows. E has a competence level of 8 for J, 4 for P, and 7 for C. B has level 5 for J, 2 for P, and 3 for C, while D has level 9 for J, 4 for P, and 8 for C. Considering that the cost of training each programmer to attain the highest level, which is level 10 competence, is proportional to their current level of competence, meaning that we will have to spend more units of resources on B to attain more level of competence for any of the programming languages we are going to assign B to. So the problem now is to find the optimal way to assign the jobs such that each programmer cannot be assigned to more than one programming language position. So these are the two examples of the problem we are trying to solve here. And the idea we learn here can also be applied to something called the traveling salesperson problem or the traveling salesman problem, a situation where somebody who is going around distributing goods from city to city or selling goods from city to city or place to place should be able to plan the routing in an optimal manner in order to save costs.
or time or both of them so let's look at the topic theoretically a matching or independent edge set both of which are used interchangeably represented by m in a graph is a set of edges such that no two edges have a vertex in common the size of the margin is the number of margins in it that's the number of edges in it a cover we say a vertex that is contained in an edge in the margin is covered by the margin a perfect margin otherwise known as a one-factor margin is a margin that contains all the vertices of a graph a maximum matching is a matching that contains the maximum number of edges. Take a first example. If we look at the graph shown by the right here, we have a matching. The matching is edges 1, 6, which are painted in green, 2, 8, and 5, 9. That is a matching of size 3, and M is maximum. Vertices 1, 2, 5, 6, 8, 9 are covered by M. You can see that they are here inside the matching set. The minimum vertex cover is the minimum number of vertices that must be in the margin in order to make it a margin. For example, if you look at the graph on the right hand side, 1 must be in the margin in order to make it a margin because this part of a graph that is disconnected should be in the margin. So, 1 is the only node that connects the two, two, two other vertices in this disconnected part. So, either 1, 6 or 1, 7 should have been in the matching, but not both of them. Because according to the definition of matching, no two edges must share a vertex. So, if you had taken 1, 7, then it would have been there, but 1 definitely must be in the matching. Secondly, if you look at this part, 5 must be in the matching. The reason is that for this part of the graph, 8 and 9 connect to 5. So for this last edge to be inside the graph, 5 must be in the matching. Thirdly, 8 must be in the matching because 8 connects 1, 2, 3, 4 vertices. So there are 4 edges here. Any one of these edges should have been considered either 4 8 or 3 8 or 2 8 but definitely it must be in the matching so 1 5 and 8 are referred to as the minimum vertex cover in this case of our matching so you can see that this matching is maximum because there is no other edge you are going to pick from this list together with the current edges that are in the matching list such that no two edges share the same vertex Next, we will consider the optimal assignment problem. The optimal assignment problem. If each edge of a bipartite graph is assigned a weight that is positive, then the problem of finding a margin in a graph such that the sum of the weights of the edges in the margin is as small as possible is known as the optimal assignment problem. So in order for us to be able to create this optimal assignment, we have to convert our graph to the bipartite graph. We assume that the bipartite graph under consideration is K subscript M comma N by introducing artificial vertices and edges where they don't exist. And for such kind of artificial edges and vertices which we will introduce, we will assign a weight of plus infinity. The weight matrix of the graph A is equal to small a subscript ij, where a subscript ij is the weight of the edge joining x, the x part of the bipartite graph, into vertex yj of the y part of the bipartite graph. Thus, a solution of the optimal assignment problem consists of a choice of n elements from A such that no two selected elements lie in the same row or column and 
the sum of the n selected entries is as small as possible. A choice of n such elements then defines an optimal matching or an optimal assignment m. Now if there exists a permutation p of the n cross n identity matrix such that the non-zero elements of p lie in the same position as n of the zeros in the weight matrix A, the selection of this n element A will form an optimal assignment M, such that sum of the weights is the dot product of the two matrices, P dot A or A dot P, which is the sum of the n square pairwise products of the entries of the two matrices. Now, if you are finding it difficult to follow what you are trying to explain here, don't worry. We are going to see several examples and everything will become clearer. In this case, we say that matrix A is matched with P. So, let's see the procedure to go about this. We are looking at the Hungarian method now. Given an arbitrary weight matrix A, we first try to find out whether we can obtain a modifier matrix A prime with no negative integers by systematically subtracting positive numbers from columns and rows such that A prime can be matched with a permutation matrix P. Remember the permutation matrix is an identity matrix. An identity matrix is a kind of matrix in which all the entries of the matrix are either 0 or 1. No other number. That's what we mean by identity matrix. So we continue. By subtracting the smallest number of a row from each entry in that row, and by continuing the process from each row, we get a modifier matrix in which each row has at least one zero. Then we can carry out the same procedure for each column. If we are able to obtain a modifier matrix that can be matched with the permutation matrix, which is an identity matrix. We are done. So let's look at an example. So we see the bipartite graph on the right hand side here. We can get a weight matrix from here. So in this case, you consider the weight matrix like an adjacency matrix. So x1, x2, x3, x4, they are on the x part of the bipartite graph. And why the other ones are on the y side of the bipartite graph. So we'll put the y side on the top, and we'll put the x part on the side. So if you have followed this course from the beginning, when we are looking at matrix representation of graphs, what you see here is just the adjacency matrix of a graph. In the case of the adjacency matrix, we only have ones and zeros, but here we actually have weights representing the weight of the edges which could be something like the cost, the distance, so on and so forth. So the weight of the connection between x1 and y1 is 5. x1 is connected to y2 by weight 4, connected to y3 by weight 2, and connected to y4 by weight 4, as you can see here. So you just follow the same procedure and you get the weight matrix. So what we are going to do is we'll look at every row. First of all, we'll begin with rows and then we'll continue with columns. Look at the smallest item in each row. Subtract it from every other element in that row. Now we are going to get 3, 2, 0, 2. Then we'll go and do the same thing for the next row, for the next row, for the next row. And what do we get? We have uh, 3, 2, 0, 2, 3, 0, 0, 2, because here we subtracted 3 smallest element here we subtract 2 and here we subtract 2 so that's where we got the 4105 from here but we need to have a 0 in every column also so we look at columns now the smallest item in this column is 3 and so we are going to subtract 3 from every other item in this column and what do we have 0 0 1 1 so what you are seeing here, this A prime matrix which, are, which we have obtained can be matched with the permutation matrix P. And if you use A prime to multiply this permutation matrix, 
take a look at the permutation matrix it's going to be a matrix in such a way that you cannot have two ones in any row and you cannot have two ones in any column they have to be mutually exclusive because you cannot have two edges that connect to the same vertex in a matching now to determine whether there is a permutation matrix that corresponds to our a prime matrix is a systematic method which we will consider next how do we obtain the permutation matrix if an association like that exists between our a prime matrix and the permutation matrix the procedure to obtain it is as follows first we will locate a row or a column with the smallest number of entries like this is our a prime matrix which we've got so if we look at this this column has one zero this one has two zeros this has two zeros this has two zeros we can look at columns or we can look at rows now this row has one zero so we'll look at all the rows this one has three zeros the first one has two zeros second row has three zeros third row has two zeros and the last row has one zero so if we take the last row then what we will do is we identify the zero that is inside it which we have here and we will now draw a vertical line here and select this zero so I painted it green to show it is selected so we'll draw a vertical line on, on it and then we'll move to the next stage suppose we chose a column we identify the zero in that column and draw a horizontal line but we are using the row method here now so after drawing this vertical line you will discover that when you look at the rows again see we are not going to look at this column anymore we've drawn a line above it so we see that this one now has the lowest number of zeros so we are going to deal with row one next we'll continue the process so we we'll look at row one select the zero in row one this is the only zero since we cancelled out this one after selecting this so we we'll draw a vertical line in column one we are now left with two rows to deal with so this one is obvious this one is the one that has a lower number of zeros now so we we'll draw a line across that select the zero that is mutually exclusive meaning that the zero we select here must not be in the same column or in the same row with another zero that has already been selected pick that and what are we left with the final zero so all the selected zeros have been painted green so it is this point where you have the zeros that have been selected and painted green that you now create a permutation matrix and put ones in such positions all right so when we come to this stage we will now go back to our original weight matrix take note whatever we are doing in the permutation to get the a prime matrix was just to help us obtain this permutation matrix so once we have obtained the permutation matrix we discard the a prime matrix and then we use the original matrix we now determine which positions to select for the optimal weight matching so the optimal weight matching will now be x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y4 and x4 y3 so these are the edges that we need to select to put in the margin to make the margin optimal so how do we calculate the minimum weight we just multiply the a matrix with the p matrix we do a, a scalar multiplication or dot product which is each element inside here just multiplies this and we add them together so that is 5 times 1 plus 3 times 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 2 times 1 so what's really happening in this summation is 5 times 1 plus every other thing in this column is 0 so we use the entire row to multiply the entire column 5 times 1 plus 4 times 0 plus 2 times 0 plus 4 times 0 6 times 0 plus 3 times 1 plus 3 times 0 plus 5 times 0 
and then we add them one by one together and what do we have 12 that is the minimum width margin and it is the optimal margin so we are still looking at the Hungarian method however sometimes such an association between a prime and P does not readily exist we might need to take another step for that to be able to obtain it the first example we saw was a very simple example for example if we consider a modified matrix A prime in which the only zero of I and the only zero of rho J they both lie on the same column K so we have an issue in cases like this we have to redistribute the zeros of the modified matrix so that it can be associated with the permutation matrix we do a little bit more work which we'll look at suppose the number of lines needed to cover the zeros is K and k at this time is less than n which is the number of rows and number of columns if t is the smallest uncovered entry we will subtract t from all the entries in each of the uncovered rows and this will convert the zero entries in the covered columns into negative entries so we'll talk about covered columns and then we'll talk about uncovered rows we see that more clearly as we progress so at this stage, we add T to all the entries in each covered column. Then we have an updated matrix with a redistribution of zeros. We continue this process until we get N lines and N entries. So let's look at an example that we highlight that. If we go back to our previous examples, where we are talking about workers Alice A, Bob B, and Dora D, available for three job tasks as follows I'm not going to describe it again we already know what the problem is so we are now trying to find the lowest cost way to assign the jobs such that each worker cannot be assigned to more than one task so if we look at the bipartite graph A represents Alice, B represents Bob, D represents Dora C for clean, S for sweep and W for wash we take the problem and put it in the bipartite graph so that it is easy for us to be able to obtain the weight matrix A so our weight matrix looks like this we have A, B, D, Alice, Bob, Dora, Clean, Sweep, Wash and all the costs are right here so our target now is how do we assign these jobs to all these workers so that we can save costs spend less money on the tasks so we we'll, we'll follow the same Hungarian method which we have been looking at and try to solve the problem first thing we do is we are going to subtract 4 from every item on this row that gives us 4 0 3 then we we'll subtract 2 from every item on the second row and that gives us 3 0 1 then we we'll subtract 4 from every item on the third row and that gives us 5 0 4 so we have an issue now all the zeros are in the same column so the next thing we'll do is deal with the columns we will now subtract 3 from every item in column 1 and that gives us 102 and we'll subtract 1 from every item in column 3 and that gives us 203 so if you look at what we have at this stage we still have an issue all the zeros lie in one row and the second set of zeros lie in the same column which we cannot use meaning that we cannot be able to have mutually exclusive arrangement of a permutation matrix so in this case this column is already selected because everything here is zero this row is also selected because everything here is zero the unselected rows are the first row and the last row we we'll look for the smallest item in the unselected row and we are going to subtract it from the unselected rows which are row 1 and row 3 later we will add it to the selected column so the first thing we we'll do is the subtraction when we subtract 1 from the first row we get 0 minus 1 and 1 and when we subtract 1 from the last row we get 1 minus 1 and 2 so according to the method we are learning 
the next stage is we will now add that same one to the selected columns which is only this column so we add it and what do we have zero one zero now with something like this we can be able to follow the procedure and try to see whether there's a permutation matrix that corresponds with this merely looking at it you can already guess what it should be but let us follow the procedure we want to now determine p in the first examples we are looking at rows now let's look at columns so we have three columns and this one has the smallest number of zeros so what we are going to do is we will draw a horizontal line across this row and then we select this zero so if we take a look at it again we now have two columns remaining the second column and the first column and when you look at them the first column has the lowest number of zeros so we select the first row and draw a line across it and we have this zero the only option remaining is the center column which has this zero so this one is very easy to do so we now take these positions and highlight them in the original matrix the moment we get this we are done with it we just use the information here to highlight the rows and columns or the items that we need to pick out from the original matrix and then we have our permutation matrix so you can build a graph from what we have here meaning that for an optimal assignment or minimum cost assignment Alice should be assigned to cleaning that's what we have here Bob should be assigned to washing that's what we have here and Dora should be assigned to sweeping that's what we have here shown in the graph we can equally calculate the minimum cost cover the way we have done it before so if you look at this example I, pre I presented here it was picked from the Hungarian method Wikipedia the minimum is 15 there is no other minimum so let's look at an analogous example this time around Alice Bob and Dora are three programmers I have explained this problem at the earlier part of the class so there is no need to explain it further we want to be able to place these programmers on the three different jobs Alice has a level 8 competence for Java 4 for Python and 7 for C Bob has level 5 for Java 2 for Python and 3 for C Dora has level 9 for Java 4 for Python and 8 for C so the problem is to find the optimal way of as assigning the job such that each programmer cannot be assigned to more than one programming language position if we take a look at the graph again it looks like the previous problem that we are trying to solve but this time around we are not looking for the minimum we are looking for a way to maximize this how do we go about that so in the same way we obtain the A matrix what we currently have in our matrix look exactly like the matrix of the previous one we solved when we are trying to solve the previous one these entries were costs we were trying to minimize the costs but in this case these entries are competence levels so we are trying to maximize the competence levels so the problem of assignment is either you are looking for the minimum weight matching or you are looking for the maximum weight matching whichever of them so i did not find a method of directly finding the maximum weight matching in the book we are using so i'm going to look at an analogous method of solving the problem in this case we are going to use the same Hungarian method of minimum weight matching which we have studied before but this time around consider the problem like this if you are trying to maximize the experience then you are trying to minimize the cost of training any one of these programmers to attain a higher competency level one way you can do this is to look for the biggest element in the set and subtract every other element in the matrix from this biggest element to obtain another matrix so what we are trying to do here now is change the values in this matrix so that the biggest values become the smallest values and the smallest values become the bigger values if we can now minimize that matrix then we'll get the optimal assignment that maximizes the competencies or the experience so there are several ways to make a bigger number smaller for instance 
if you have a set of numbers and you take the reciprocal of the numbers 1 over 2 the smaller numbers will become bigger another way is subtract all the numbers from a fixed number the smaller numbers will become bigger so since we are looking at a competency level of 10 as the maximum competence I will say that we, sub we subtract everything in this matrix from 10 in order to obtain a new matrix which we will call A star so 10 minus 8 is 2 10 minus 4 is 6 10 minus 7 is 3 see the bigger numbers are now becoming the smaller numbers 9 which was biggest before 10 minus 9 is 1 so we are now going to work with this matrix in order to be able to obtain the permutation matrix after obtaining the permutation matrix we'll come back to, to the original matrix and use it continue with it so we'll continue with the A star matrix so the first thing is to subtract 2 from every item in the first row and we have 0 for 1 second thing is subtract 5 from every item in the second row and we have 0 3 2 then we subtract 1 from the third row and we have 0 5 1 so we have the same problem we encountered before now we are going to deal with columns we we'll subtract 3 from the second column and we have 1 0 2 and then we we'll subtract 1 from the third column and we we'll have 1 0 1 so we have a sufficient number of zeros here that we do not need to do any other further manipulation the next thing we need to do now is obtain the permutation matrix so our permutation matrix is straightforward it is 1 1 1 either way we could have also had 1 1 1 here it will still give us the solution that we are looking for so recall how we solve this problem you can either go row or column if we go column wise we take the first column and then we select this zero and cross out this row and then we are left with two more columns either one of them could have been selected because both of them have two zeros so we either take this and this or we take this and this whichever way we get the permutation matrix the moment we are done with the permutation matrix we can discard this and use the original matrix so what we are getting out is in the original matrix we are taking a j which is 8 bp which is 2 and dc which is 8 so that's one way to do that if we now look for the weight it is 8 plus 2 plus 8 which gives us 18 that is the maximum weight matching if we had taken this one this one and this one what we will have that would have been a to c which is 7 b to p which is constant that is 2 and d to g which is 9 and uh, the weight would have been 7 plus 2 plus 9 and it is the same 18 no difference so whichever one we choose as we see when we solve this problem using network x it actually chose the 7 plus 2 plus 9 and gave us 18 so there is no difference that's the solution so the next thing we are going to do now is look at a network x example of this problem that we just tried to solve so we'll call this program matching 0.py to demonstrate matchings in network x as usual we do all the inputs if you don't understand what is going on in this part of the program please try to follow the previous videos of the class where all of these things are explained we import network x as nx and we import matplotlib.pyplot as plt we create an empty graph the next thing is to add edges and weights this has already been explained in the previous classes so we add an edge alice javascript capacity equal to 8 alice python capacity equal to 4 And then we set the node positions in Cartesian coordinates so that we can look at the graph the way it is, the way we drew it. 
So all these are just X and Y positions in the Cartesian coordinate. So we can see our graph clearly. We are going to use two subplots because we will plot the first graph and then we will plot the graph we obtained from the matching. We give it a title. So we draw the nodes and we draw the labels. So we now want to draw the edges. Everything you see here has been explained before in the previous classes. So please, if you can't follow them, try to go to the previous classes and see them. So we say for edge in g dot edges, we create a variable and we are going to get the weight capacity from here, and we use that in a drawing. Okay, edge edge list equal to edge zero, edge one, weight equal to five, edge color equal to gray. So we create our edge label using the weight. And then we'll draw the edge labels. Now, this is the new thing we are going to do here. Finding the maximum weight margin. So, we just call it from Python. Nx.max weight matching g. Print it to see what is there for the purpose of learning. And then we can make a new graph out of it. In fact, the moment you obtain the maximum weight matching, you have already obtained it. Is there for you. It's going to give you a list of edges in the matching. However, we want to show it in a plot. That's why we are trying to create a new graph out of it here. And then we'll make a new subplot. And we give it a title. Maximum weight matching of G. We'll draw the network nodes. And we'll draw the network labels. So, the next thing we want to do is plot the graph for the matching the way we saw it in the in the notes here we are going to plot only edges in the original graph that are matching m so we are going to search out for edges in the original graph and then we also look for edges in our new graph which we made out from the matching sorry i'm using node here it's actually not node maybe it's a wrong variable to be used but don't be bothered about it whether it is edge whether it's node whether it's edge 2 or whatever the, the important thing is you must not use the same variable as the one you used here so what we are going to do is we are going to check if this edge in the matching corresponds to an edge in the original graph then plot it out so i observed from the printed out results that what this function does or this class does is it swaps the edges the edges are not directed edges so it could have been from any vertex to any vertex or any node to any node so i observed that it swaps it that's why i'm swapping it here also so we can now extract the weight capacity for the original graph we are not using the new the new one now what we are trying to do is compare the original graph with the one we obtained from the matching. And if they are the same, plot the one in the original graph. Only the ones in the original graph that corresponds to the one in the matching. So we can now draw the edges and draw the edge labels and show the graph. Now we are going to go to Network X and run this program and see exactly what we get out of it. So our program is matching zero, which we just looked at. I don't need to explain this program anymore because I've already explained it in the notes. So I'm just going to go ahead and run the program. So this is the graph we obtained after running the program. This is the original graph right here. So after the computation, the maximum matching that was obtained is Alice is assigned to C, Dora is assigned to JavaScript, and Bob is assigned to Python. This corresponds to the solution that we obtained by hand. So 
we continue with the traveling salesperson's problem, which is also described as the traveling salesman problem. This problem is related to matching. That's why we are considering it as a part of this topic. So like I earlier described, the traveling salesperson's problem is the problem of going around to several locations in an optimal manner in order to save cost or time or both of them. In order to understand this better, we refresh our mind on some of the things we have learned earlier on in the course. We talk about a path, which is a travel along the graph, with the restriction that you can only traverse an edge once or visit a vertex exactly once. A closed path is a path that returns to the initial vertex it started from, wherever it started from. And we say a cycle is a closed path with at least three vertices. And a Hamiltonian cycle is a cycle that passes through every vertex. We now describe something called the optimal Hamiltonian problem, which is the problem of finding a Hamiltonian cycle of minimum width, if at all it exists, assuming that the weight of all the edges in the graph are positive, none of them is negative. The traveling salesperson problem now becomes equivalent to the optimal Hamiltonian problem. Now we talk about another closed problem which is called the optimal salesperson's problem. This is the problem of finding a closed part of minimum weight that passes through each vertex at least once. So if you look at the description of path, the restriction is you must pass through a vertex exactly once. You cannot go to a vertex twice and you cannot traverse an edge twice. However, there is a little bit of release on the conditions. Instead of saying exactly once, we now say at least once for the optimal salesperson problem. Some people refer it as the optimal salesman problem, some refer it as the optimal salesperson problem. All of them are the same. So, several methods to solve the traveling salesman problem include a branch and bound method, which is highly computational. So, basically, what we are trying to learn here is uh, something we can solve by hand in order to understand the principles behind it, and that is the approximate solution, which is the second method. I don't know if there are other methods, but these are the ones I found in the book. So, an approximate solution can be used to obtain a Hamiltonian cycle whose weight does not exceed twice the weight of the optimal Hamiltonian cycle. So, the approximate solution naturally gives us a suboptimal solution, but at least it is a solution that can be easily obtained by hand and has a low computational burden. So, here are the steps to perform the approximate solution. Step 1. Choose any vertex V1 as the initial cycle C1 with one vertex. Step 2. Let C subscript K be a cycle with K vertices. The vertices in this cycle are arranged on a line with V1 as the first and the last. From each vertex, except the first vertex in this line, Select a vertex that is not already in C subscript K that is nearest to that vertex. Among those selected vertices, choose a vertex U that is closest to the vertices in C subscript K. Let V be the vertex that is adjacent to U. Let CK be the cycle obtained by inserting U adjacent to V on its left on the line. Then we'll continue repeating these steps 2 and 3 until all the vertices are included in the cycle. So let's see an example to make it clearer. Example 5. Solve the traveling salesperson's problem for the graph shown below. So we have vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What is the most optimal way or what is the optimal way for us to move from vertex 1, go around all the vertices and come back to vertex 1 at a minimum cost. So what you are seeing here, which are the weights of the edges, can either be the cost of moving from one vertex to any other vertex 
or the distance of moving from one vertex to, to any other vertex or both of them so as usual we are going to obtain the weight matrix since it's not a bipartite graph and we are dealing with just a set of vertices we are going to use infinity to represent the connection between any vertex and itself There's, there are no loops so we are going to represent them with infinity so we don't consider them I will follow the procedure we just described step 1 V1 we take vertex 1 as 1 and C1 is just vertex 1 and 1 itself we are going to build it from there so step 2 we will now look for which vertex is closer to 1 since we have selected 1 normally what we do is look at row 1 this is the one we have selected and we are going to look for the smallest item there what column is it in is 4 so vertex 4 is closer to 1 you can see that 2 is smaller than any other thing that is connecting 1 5 is 7 3 is 3 and 4 is the lowest so since 4 is closer to 1 we put 4 to the left of this one and we are building our set so there are two different vertices there now so that makes it C2 and we we'll continue like that we now come to row 4 because we are in vertex 4 and we check through row 4 and see which one is the smallest this is 1 and that is 1 2 3 which means that vertex 3 is closest to 4 and C is 1 so we pick 3 and put it here to the left side of 4 because it is closest to 4 we we'll continue so we are now looking at vertex 3 among the vertices not yet in CK we had 3, 4, 1 before we are now in vertex 3 since 3 is already closer to 4 by 1 the next thing we are looking at is between these two so this is 1 which we are starting from we are not going to pick 1 anymore what are we going to pick? vertex 2 so we have taken vertices 1, 2, 3, 4 the remaining one is 5 if we come and look at vertex 5 here which one is the closest to 3 so you see 5 is actually closer to 3 than closer to 2 so we are going to take 5 and put it in between 3 and 2 and we already got our set everything is completed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 everything is listed here so if we take this set of edges 1 to 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1. Or we start from the right. If we start from the right and take the vertices, 1 to 4, 4 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 2, and 2 to 1, we are going to have our optimal path in order to go around the vertices. So this is what we have here. Once you have obtained this, you can actually move from any vertex to any vertex along the set of edges that are represented here. It doesn't matter where you start from. As long as you go back to the same vertex where you started from, you are still going to have the same optimal distance. If we start from 2, for instance, and we'll go from 2 to 1, from 1 to 4, from 4 to 3, from 3 to 5, and from 5 to 2, it is still the same distance. No difference. And when you calculate the weight, you are going to get 15. Whichever vertex you start from, as long as you return to the same vertex, it is 15. So we have solved the traveling salesman problem by using the method we just described. Like we stated earlier and before when we started the algorithm, the method we just used is not an optimal method. However, half of the solution that we obtained from there is a lower band for the width of an optimal Hamiltonian cycle of a graph. Because this is a simple problem, I'm not sure whether there is any other optimal solution that is more optimal than we, the one we just considered. But at any rate, this condition holds. So we have a suboptimal solution. So when I look at a network X example of this, we call this program T 
TSP0.py to demonstrate the traveling salesperson's problem in Network X. As usual, we start by doing all our imports and then we'll create an empty graph and uh, we'll go about the same method to add the edges to the graph and the capacities or the weight of the edges on this side. And then we'll put the node positions in the Cartesian coordinate plane. So this program is almost exactly the one we just explained before. So I'm not explaining everything all over again. We are going to create first subplot and we'll call it graph hash. Plot the nodes, plot the labels, and then plot the edges just to show the first graph. This is where something new happens. We are now going to solve this, the traveling salesman problem. In Network X, it is the salesman problem that they try to solve. It's the same thing as the salesperson's problem. So it's just simple. We'll create a variable to represent this class. Whatever variable you call it is equal to nx.approximation.traveling salesman problem. So create another variable. TSPS here, that's traveling salesman problem solution equal to TSP. Indicate the graph and indicate the nodes where you want it to travel to. So, what this says is we want an optimal solution to move from node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and back to 1, or to go, go about all of these nodes in an optimal manner. And every other information is going to be obtained from this graph, like the weights or the capacities of the edges. Print it to see what it returns. It actually returns a set of nodes, like we did in our calculation. So let's try to plot it. First, we'll make a graph out of it. And we'll follow the same procedure that we did before. So since TSPS returns a set of nodes, like we did, we just add the nodes to the graph. Now, in order to add edges to the graph, we are going to loop through the nodes that we are returned and create edges from them. Every node and the next node forms an edge all the way around. When we run the program, we see exactly what was returned, so we can understand this better. So the next thing is we are going to create a subplot, and we'll follow the same procedure that we did before. Since this graph that we have created is just a subgraph of the original graph. We are going to compare it with the original graph and any edges that are the same will plot that edge from the original graph. Saves us more time and we do less work. So we say for edge in g dot edges data equal to true for node in gsp dot edges data equal to true. In this case what actually happened is that it is possible for our new graph to swap the vertices in the original graph and it is also possible not to swap them. So all we are trying to do here is the original graph can have something like 1, 2 as its edge and the new graph can have something like 1, 2 or 2, 1. It doesn't matter since the edges are not directed. And we don't know when it is either going to be like this or be like this. So what we are going to do is cater for all the situations. Whether this and this are the same, and this and this are the same, or this and this are the same, and this and this are the same. That's what we are trying to do here. If edge 0 equal to node 0 and edge 1 equal to node 1, or edge 0 equal to node 1 and edge 1 equal to node 0. When you run the program, just check out the output you get and see whether this works for you or whichever way you want to arrange it. So, if that condition is satisfied, you can plot the edges in the original graph. And you can also plot the edge labels in the original graph. So, if you look at what we are plotting here, we are not using the new graph. Rather, we are selecting things from the original graph that correspond to the new graph we created. Finally, you show the plot. So we are going to go to Visual Studio Code and run this program and see exactly what we get. So here we are in Visual Studio Code and this is the program we just described. I don't have to describe it again. I will just run it so we see the output we get. So this is the output of the program. This is our original graph 
and this is our traveling salesman solution which is the optimal path whichever path you go through is still the same if you start from five for instance you go to three you go to four then you go to one then you go to two you come back to five is the same wherever you start from it's going to give you the optimal path this is the output that was returned when we did the python traveling salesman solution just gives you a set of nodes so all we needed to do was build a set of edges from the nodes 1 to 4, 4 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 2, 2 to 1. So our bibliography remains the book of Balakrishnan V, the book of Edward Platt, the book of Philippo Mensa, other materials and numerous video tutorials. Be sure to check on my YouTube video tutorials and online tutorials. So Please like, share, comment, and subscribe for more videos. Thank you, and see you in the next class.